Thanks for, um, for uh, tuning in for this. I'm gonna talk today about the durability of immunity following infection by SARS-CoV-2. And this is a collaboration uh, led by me with a bunch of members of my lab and some other folks who have uh, worked on it with me who are all listed here. So uh, start from the beginning, the durability of immunity upon natural infection has been called by many the greatest unknown factor of the COVID-19 epidemic. Uh, just to give you some examples of this, uh, yeah, on the left, you see a nature video talking about uh, the, uh, the big questions six months on, uh, the major one of which that they highlighted was what is the durability of immunity once you get infected. Uh, secondly, on the right is a news article from STAT, uh, seven months later, what we know about COVID-19 and the pressing questions that remain. And in there, you'll find that one of the ones they highlight to the greatest degree is what is the durability of immunity of COVID-19. Now, most of the studies that have uh, spoken about this topic have done longi longitudinal observation, uh, looking at the decline of some kind of antibody response uh, after infection by SARS-CoV-2. The difficulty with doing that on SARS-CoV-2 and getting a result is that uh, the decline of antibody uh, of any body level occurs uh, fairly slowly. Um, and as you can see in this, one of the first papers that came out, uh, essentially there's not much decline here. There's just the increase consequent to infection uh, in these three different IgG types, and then sort of a leveling off. And in a few individuals, there's a little bit of decline, but really on average, you're not seeing the decline yet. And that's characteristic uh, actually of all coronaviruses that they tend to dec start declining around 90 days. Um, and that's already three months in advance. In a short epidemic like this, there's just not enough information to figure out what the decline of antibodies is and what its correlation with uh, immunity is. So that news um, that in fact, uh, you know, uh, that in fact uh, antibodies may decline uh, sparked some fears that immunity to COVID-19 wanes fast. Um, this is just a, a news article saying studies show coronavirus antibodies may fade fast, raising questions about vaccines. And then, uh, but you can find answers sort of both ways. So many have deemed the question impossible to address. This epidemic is so recent, there've been few well-monitored reinfections. Um, so here on the left, you see one saying, my patient caught COVID-19 twice, so so long to herd immunity. You know, is, is there no immunity that you get from this disease? And then another article uh, simultaneously or very nearly simultaneously, can you get COVID-19 again? It's very unlikely, experts say. So it would be really great to answer this question. And I'm here to say we can answer this question. On the contrary, there's not nothing known, but we do know something about the durability of immunity to SARS-CoV-2. And the reason we know it is because of the historical contingencies of evolutionary biology. Uh, SARS-CoV-2 is a coronavirus like multiple other coronaviruses that are listed here. SARS-CoV-1, the, th the three, the, the human coronaviruses you may be familiar with that are cause the common cold regularly. MERS is another example. Uh, and those coronaviruses all have uh, genetic differences that tell us how closely related they are to each other. So we can learn something from the other coronaviruses about SARS-CoV-2. And there's a very rigorous way of doing that, and that is by phylogenetic analysis. So if we look at the different viruses, we can see how closely related they are. And the fact is that viruses can't evolve super quickly. They have limits to the rate at which they can evolve and how fast they can change. And we have methods in evolutionary biology to understand how fast they change across a phylogenetic tree, such as this one, which we reconstructed from the genome sequences. So uh, the kind of data that we want to take into account to the, do this is to look at continuous, is you, we want to do continuous ancestral and descendant state inference under a Brownian motion model of trait evolution. And the kind of data we're looking at is this anti-N, which is one of the genes of, coronavir of the coronavirus, IgG, which is just an antibody type, um, across time. So this paper by Edridge et al. Uh, very fortunately looked at the three, uh, I'm going to talk about three of the seasonal coronaviruses here over time and examined when they had peaks, these starry points, which indicate that there was an infection in an individual. Uh, uh, these are in the seasonal coronaviruses. And then that allows us both to understand what levels of antibody allow an individual to get infected, but also how long it takes for them to decline between uh, times of being infected. So analyzing both of those things across the uh, coronaviruses, and I'm sorry, this appears um, much more pixelated on the screen than it uh, did when I made it, but uh, we're able to actually characterize the peak normalized antibody levels 
over time based on that kind of data for these human coronaviruses, we're also able to characterize the daily probability of infection or how long over, over time it takes, how likely are you to be infected as your antibody level declines. Uh, this is for these seasonal coronaviruses for which that longitudinal data over many, many years, that was over decades, was collected. Now, in addition to understanding this about the seasonal coronaviruses, they're embedded in this phylogenetic tree that it allows us, enables us to also study the seasonal coronaviruses for which we don't have daily probability of infection data, but for which we do have some data on the, on the um, IgG, IgA, IgM, on this uh, information about the antibody level. So combining that data uh, based on what we already know about SARS-CoV-2, SARS-CoV-1, MERS-CoV, and these three seasonal coronaviruses, combined with the information on daily probability of infection, we're able to use phylogenetic methods to impute what the daily probability is of infection and what the rest of the uh, antibody decline is probably like for each of these uh, um, zoonotic coronaviruses, enabling us to estimate the time of waning of immunity, the probability of infection over time, and the probability density of reinfection. So what this gives us is this probability of density of reinfection over time. This is an axis of days on the axis here. And you can see that although there's some differences between the antibody decline and the daily probabilities of infection among these different diseases, the overall distribution of when you get in of, of a time of reinfection does not appear to be all that different between these different diseases. Consequently, what we can conclude um, uh, in our main analysis is the following, that the median time to reinfection by SARS-CoV-2 appears to be about one year, seven months. Uh, SARS-CoV-1 is quite longer. Uh, SARS-CoV-2, by our best estimate, SARS-CoV-2, again, one year, seven months. MERS, one year, four months. Although it's never been, uh, you know, you don't get reinfections because the zoonotic disease does not spread from human to human. And for the different uh, seasonal coronaviruses, we get somewhere between four to six years for the duration of that. So what are my conclusions? They are that this ancestral and descendant states estimate of the timing of the waning of immunity can facilitate a quantitative analysis of all policy decision-making with regard to individuals who've recovered from COVID-19 and who may be viewed as immune to reinfection but may not be after some time. Uh, secondly, the durability of immunity, of immunity has implications for the deployment of recovered healthcare workers, of travel restrictions, decisions on how students obtain their education, uh, prospective vaccination protocols for clinical trials, as well as the opening and closing of economic sectors in response to predictive models of the epidemic. Uh, our estimate strong, argues strongly against the claim that a long-standing resolution of the epidemic could arise due to any kind of herd immunity from natural infection. Such a strategy jeopardizes millions of lives, entailing high rates of infection, morbidity, and death every 1.5 years. It provides some guidance as to the likely time scale of immunity conferred by a typical vaccine. I'll have a caveat about that in a moment. Uh, this approach has general applicability to rapid prediction of parameters for any novel pathogens, provided they're embedded in a clade containing three or more previously studied human pathogens. Uh, I just want to give you a few caveats to make sure it's clear what we can and can't say from this. The research addressed durability of immunity in response to typical natural infections under endemic conditions. Uh, the durability in response to vaccination requires a little further analysis because vaccination doesn't give you the same antibody level response that uh, natural infection does necessarily. Uh, and also we're under pandemic conditions until the world's population has been exposed to the disease or vaccination. And so uh, that means that some of the timings are gonna be slightly different for some complicated epidemiological re reasons. Uh, our estimate in some certainty should be understood as a prediction of the average durability, not universal to everybody. Uh, we know that different antibody levels are sparked by different infection levels and by different vaccines. So uh, each individual is slightly different. This is what's typical. And because SARS-CoV-2 is a novel virus to the human immune system, the reinfection may not exhibit the same severity as first infections we will have to see as time goes on. Thanks very much for the time and from the support from NSF to do this very interesting research.